This week on Quality Digest Live, do babies really know who to blame when things go wrong? Do they do? They do, <laughs> it turns out. And Bruce Hamilton uh, is going to tell us all about guillotines. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for July 1st, 2011. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm editor-in-chief Dirk Ducharme. Well, we start this week with an article, actually a couple of articles, about knowing what problems you can fix and which ones you can't. Uh, this is a story, actually, that came from, um, I got it here on the screen, a story that came from uh, MIT. It was a research uh, into what uh, kind of the, the cognitive abilities of, of babies. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're probably wondering what a story about babies has to do in a magazine about quality. Well, we'll get to that mm -hmm. because we're going to tie two stories together. Yep. So the first story, uh, this research at MIT, um, what they did is they took a, a, a group of babies, 16 months old, and they had a couple of experimenters uh, perform some operations in front of them to see what the babies would recognize, whether they could recognize patterns into where problems were actually occurring. And the experiment went something like this. Uh, the experimenters, two of them, had a toy. When you pushed a button, when one experimenter would push a button on a toy, the toy would light up, play sounds, that sort of thing. He would hand it over to another experimenter. That experimenter would push the button nothing would happen. Right. Hand it back to the first experiment, push a button, lights up, plays, everything. First experiment, push the button, nothing happens. The idea was that perhaps if the babies are watching this, they're getting the idea that one experimenter knows what he's doing and the other one is a doofus. Right. Okay, now the other experiment was same experimenters. One of them takes a toy, pushes the button, nothing happens. The other one takes the toy, pushes the button, nothing happens. So no matter who pushes the button, nothing happens. The idea being that perhaps the babies will pick up on the fact that it isn't the experimenters. It's a problem with the system. It's a problem with the system. It's right. a problem with the toy. And the results were, and they didn't give the statistics on this, but essentially, yes, the babies could recognize this. So a 16-month-old baby, when they saw the first experiment where it would work for one experimenter, not another, they would give the toy to the baby. Mm -hmm. The baby would press the button. Nothing would happen. And what they would do is they would hand the toy to their parent. Fix it. We've seen that. Exactly. Right. We've, all we've all had little kids do that. They know it's supposed to light up. They know this toy is supposed to do something that doesn't. Wah! They give it to you to fix it, right? right? They saw that babies actually did that. The other experiment where the toy didn't work for either experimenters, they would give the toy to the baby. The baby would push the button. Nothing would happen. They wouldn't hand it to their parents. They would set the toy down and reach for another, another toy. toy. And researchers are concluding maybe that the babies are recognizing the difference between a toy that is defective versus an operator who doesn't know what they're doing. And so I, I'm at fault, therefore fix it, or it's not me, it's the toy, I'm just gonna grab a new one. Right, right. Okay, what does it have to do with anything? Exactly. Well, to me, when, when Taryn, our Taryn March, one of our editors, gave me the story, uh, initially I was, I was going to kind of pass on it because she does kind of throw me a lot a lot of edgy stories mm -hmm. some of them which kind of tie into our audience some of them I, I feel uh, don't and so we don't run those but this one I had to take a second look at mm -hmm. because the first thing that came to me is well not what the experimenters were looking they're looking at something completely I'm going how lean yeah. are 16 year olds right it's 16, like 16 month olds 16 yeah. month olds yeah we know, we know 16, <laughs> 16, <laughs> 16 year olds are far from lean uh, 16 month old they grab this toy it doesn't work they don't right. futz with it they know that there's no point. They're, they know there's no point. Yeah. So they either hand it off to an adult, yeah. you know, make it work for me, or they get rid of it and grab, grab another one. The implications for this, to me, came in the next story. Yep. Uh, we had another uh, story, I'm on the website here, um, from Angelo Lyle, who is a, a frequent contributor. He wrote a very short and elegant piece on what is quality. And basically, he's kind of trying to condense down what quality is um, and, and looking at it from really the, the customer perspective and what we do as, as marketers. Mm -hmm. And he brought up five, um, he had five uh, bulleted points I'm going to uh, show yep. here. And, and these are his five points in, in a nutshell. Lessons, what is quality? Lesson one, customers are the sum 
are their expert expectations. So for us, as, as a provider, our customers are the sum of everything that they expect, their experiences, what they expect from the product, sure. and so forth. Mm -hmm. Marketing, sales make us aware of those expectations, that's so true. that's how we knowledge ourselves about, knowledge ourselves is a verb I just made up. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Knowledge ourselves about um, what their expectations are. Right. The third one, which we'll get back to, for each relevant quality attribute, there is an optimum level. Yep. The fourth lesson, be different, differentiate yourself. And lesson five, obviously, for all of us work in quality, minimize variation. You know what your target is, try to stay on target with as little variation around that as possible. Sure. Well, let's get back to lesson three. Lesson three. For each relevant quality attribute, there's an optimum level. The firm's goal is to design its value offering to meet or exceed the expected level of each relevant mm -hmm. attribute within profitable boundaries. And we don't need the rest of that. That's really the, 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 the crux of it. So what he's saying is that, and what everybody who is smart and works in, in, in quality understands is it's, it's one thing to understand what an attribute is. It's another thing to understand, is this attribute something that's worth pursuing? Right. Is it profitable? Mm -hmm. Is it something that the, that the client or the customer really needs mm -hmm. and really, really wants? And so you have to spend effort on it, or is it something that you, like the baby, you just throw it throw aside, pass it over the fence, yeah. put it aside, whatever, and go on to more important things. This ties in with an article we covered in QDD and on QDL last month by Stuart Anderson about how much quality is too much. Remember, we, we talked about that story about right. can you over-improve your product or service to the point where you just have to raise your price in order to, to get that buyback. So exactly. this is a very similar analogous uh, situation, I think. Right, and, and the thing that's, that, that was funny to me, the reason I tie these two stories together is because as babies and, and, and really young, young kids, kids, maybe up to five, six years old, the idea that something is broke, fix it or get rid of it, mm -hmm. is in place. Once you get, maybe you see teenagers starting to do this where you give them a problem and you'll see two teenagers, one teenager's, try, teenager's trying to make something work sure. and the other one comes, oh no, let me, let me fix, no, no. Right? We start to learn that at an early age. It's like, I'm going to fix it myself. It doesn't matter whether it's worth fixing or not. Right. It's a, it's a point. It's a point. And unfortunately, I think that gets into our organizations where a lot of times we spin our wheels sure. trying to fix problems that would make just as much sense just to set aside. Well, it's a personality type as well of people in, in this profession that sure. you want to fix things, right? You want, you want to have problems and be able to go away and be, be, be repaired. Uh, what I thought was most interesting about this story was, was why does this happen? Why do, why why is it almost seemingly a, um, an inherited trait that we have this sense, this instinctive sense of what you can fix what you can and discard what you can't? How does it build in right. over the course of time that we start having this idea that, oh no, I'm going gonna, gonna, I'm gonna to repair this regardless of any of the right. odds or right. any of their experience? I'm not going to read the manual. No. I'm not going to ask for directions. I'm not going to ask for directions. Yeah. Stereotypical guy thing. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, I, my, my wife could tell you, I don't even pay attention to the GPS. No, absolutely. GPS is telling me, turn left. And I'm going, no, no, I know a shortcut. <laughs> my wife's like pulling out her hair. Um, you know, it's, it's like we, we've got to do it ourselves. Sure. And I think at an organizational level, at a quality level, you have, to do, you have to have that personality. You have to want to do that to a certain extent, but you also need to behave like a kid and know when to let go. Okay. Re remember uh, 20 years ago, there was that, um, that poster, uh, everything I need to know about life I learned in kindergarten right. or, or something like right. that. There's a lot of truth in that, and I, <laughs> I think sometimes we just forget, we get so caught up in problem solving that we forget to act like a kid, which is really sometimes just set that toy down and go on to one that's going to be much more profitable. Move on. Yeah, move on. Yeah, yep. move on. Excellent. A excellent point. Another, another good story. So check that one out. And, and the story link again is, is uh, below the player here uh, on, on QDL this yep. episode. Thanks. Thanks, Dark. Well, I had a story this week that I wanted to cover. And, and I'm a history buff. As, guillotine. As many of us know. Guillotine. <laughs> and this, this story you just cut me to the quick. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I know. That's the second really, really, oh, wow. really cheesy. And I won't cut the cheese. No, I'm sorry. Um, the guillotine, yes. Uh, and uh, or guillotine for our, our thousands of friends watching us in, in Quebec or, or France right now. Um, guillotine is a story written by our good friend Bruce Hamilton. Right. And Bruce is the old lean dude is his moniker. And he's written for us for now for uh, about a year or yeah, two. Yeah, he has a great blog. Great blog. I encourage you to check that one out. And uh, Bruce always talks about lean and, and about these different ideas. Uh, manufacturing is, is his, his bread and butter. Well, 
the, the, the guillotine uh, motif that he uses in the story really uh, starts from a, a process of outsourcing. And, and now, you know, U.S. firms in particular have outsourced many of their processes now for, for a few decades. So we, we've had a track record now of, of looking at how this has gone. And, and Bruce, uh, Bruce talks about this and he says, well, what we've done is we've, we've applied the guillotine. We've cut off the head from the body and we've kept the, the head, in other words, the management, the, the innovators, the, the creative team, those that develop products and kept them here in the States while we outsource the, the less important, the body work, the, the, the manufacturing itself, the roll up your sleeves work to China or to Malaysia or, or Indonesia, wherever it might be, uh, uh, Thailand, India. But curiously, what he's finding and, and the point he's making here is that this really has run counter to what the intention is. The intention is, again, you know, you keep the management here, you have the innovators here, and, and the people over there just do the, do the busy work. But what we know and what manufacturers know is where, where do great ideas really come from? Right. Ultimately, they come right. from the shop they floor. They come from the shop floor, They yeah. come from the guys and the gals rolling up their sleeves, getting into a process, looking at it, and saying, hey, there's a better way to do this. In fact, I, I believe the way um, Bruce put it in there is, is not only have we shipped the body overseas, uh, we shipped the Gemba. The, right. And, yeah. And, yeah. and that's where we get... I mean, we talk about the Gemba Walk. That's where we get the idea for, you know, how do sure. we make things better? Sure. Except now the people who are doing the Gemba aren't, aren't here. us, they're them. How, and it's very hard <laughs> to walk a floor when it's 8,000 miles away. Exactly. And, and, and somebody else is walking it for you, for you. Uh, because you've outsourced to and them. And they're learning those lessons. And they're learning those lessons, and they're exactly. Eating, yeah. And they're eating yeah. the U.S. manufacturer's lunch because of it. This yeah. is a really interesting point. And, and furthermore, it even gets more interesting than that. China, as a place that was primarily the destination point for a lot of these jobs, now they're outsourcing a lot of these manufacturing sure. jobs to to countries like Vietnam, for lower instance. Lower cost. Yeah, lo even lower <laughs> for the cost same reasons, than that, yeah. for the yep. same reasons. Yep. They're going to find, I think, the same thing in, in 10, 20, 30 years, that, that those, com those countries that they outsource to are going to be eating their lunch and developing processes that beat them at their own game. It's a very interesting thing. The other point he makes about this is, uh, which is related, is this idea of, of companies, large organizations merging e with each other, M&A activities, where you, you had you know, redundant processes in IT or HR or marketing sales, whatever it may be, and the acquiring company, and of course, hey, we all know mergers of equals are rarely sure. anything of the kind, the acquiring company generally cuts out 90% of the workforce of the company they take over. And, you lose a lot from that. Yes, you, you reduce your headcount in the short term. It's a benefit. You save money. Stock prices often go up, and, and Bruce uses the example of GM that did this in the, in the 80s and 90s. But you really lose a lot of the energy. You lose a lot of the creative ideas, the innovation, the, the, the culture of that com company that went away. I mean, yes, they were embedded somewhat in the acquiring company, but it really mostly went away. So this idea of, of using the guillotine, chopping off the head from the body, <clears throat> chopping head count, as the case may be, uh, reducing that, is in the short term benefit, in the long term, maybe not so much. And right. I, I think this was really a good point he makes. And again, encourage you all out there to read the story, comment on it, and go out to Bruce's blog too. He's got a lot of great content. Well, I, I guess, and, and Bruce doesn't really address this, but despite everything that you know, politicians may say and that you know, business people may say, oh, we've got to bring manufacturing back to the United States, Sorry, I, I personally, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think we're going to reverse the tide. It's more going to be, what do we do now? How do we, how do we work within the system that I think well, is, is pretty much there to stay? And how do we innovate to, to discover new, sec new sectors that we can, we can have here in this country that can be right. ours and not outsource it? How do we insource it? How do we keep right. it here in, in this country? And this is, a, this is a major issue. Hey, most of, of you watching today are, are in the U.S. Most of our, our readership right. in the U.S. And, this is an important issue, so we're going to be watching out for it, and we hope you will be as well. Yep. So, um, before we get to our next section, yes. uh, Tech Narasi, um, sorry, uh, Tech, Tech Corner. Corner. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, we did get a letter last week. Oh, I'd great. like to go to that. I got a, I got a slide up here uh, for that. Oh, great. And um, uh, this was uh, from Christine uh, Gautier. Mm -hmm. um, Mike and Dirk, I just started watching your live presentation today. I really enjoy this format. I can put on my headset. I guess she doesn't want to watch us <laughs> and listen <laughs> while I work. <laughs> don't want to see your face, but hey, I'll listen to you. Um, I don't have a lot of spare time to read all the articles that I get weekly, so thank you for accommodating. Keep it up. Christine, I hope you're listening right now, even if you aren't. Watching. Watching our, well, our watch lovely us. faces. We're saying hello to you, Christine. <laughs> thank you for joining right. us here on Friday. Okay. Wonderful. Um, 
Well, Tech, tech uh, Corner. Tech Corner, that's right. Uh, tech Corner, uh, as we mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. we were in Orlando for a big conference out there, and while we were there, we had a chance to look at a variety of uh, equipment, some of them that was, some equipment that was new to us, but certainly equipment that would be interesting to, uh, to some of you out there. Um, this piece of equipment, uh, actually is, is probes, uh, these are probes that would be used for on-machine verification. And uh, in a little second, I'll, I'll introduce the, the, the clip, but um, the presenter on this one is going to be Dave Jeffers, who's with uh, PC Demus Machine Tool. And what he's going to show us is a variety of tools that can be used to make on-machine inspection or on-machine verification uh, much more accurate and easier to do. A lot of you know, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, mechanical, I'm sorry, uh, uh, dimensional inspection being done on CNC's is slowly migrating to be actually done on the CNC itself, not taking it out of the chuck, taking it over to a lab or taking it yep. offline, measuring it, bringing it back up, have to refixture it, whatever. Uh, number one, that's time consuming. Number two, it introduces error. Sure does. When possible, if you can actually measure a part while it's still chucked up on the CNC, that's a much better way to go, but there are some issues involved with that and some of the issues involved what kind of probes will we use. Yep. So uh, we're going to watch a little two and a half minute clip here as um, Dave Jeffers described to me some of the products, some of the probe products that are available uh, from Hexagon and uh, he'll also talk a little bit about uh, PC Demus uh, software. So uh, why don't you go ahead and roll that, Chris. Take it away, Dave. Yep. These stations are about on-machine gauging uh, or on-machine inspection. Specifically the machines that we're talking about are machine tools. So the concept that Hexagon Metrology has expanded into is instead of taking your product and manufacturing it and then taking it over to a machine to do the inspection, we're hoping that you can actually do some of your inspection at the machine tool. On the right, we've got machines that use radio frequency to communicate the information back to the machine tool. And then on the left, we have probes that uh, use optical sensors to relate that information back. We're very proud of our probing line because we've got a number of enhancements that we put into them uh, that differentiate us from our competitors. So for instance, up on top here, we've got a triggering device. Uh, the idea here is we want to keep the triggering device close to your part to maintain uh, the maximum amount of accuracy. So what we can do is add attachments uh, between the probe and the triggering device to keep that uh, trigger device close. Some other neat concepts, uh, most of my competitors require tools to change out the battery. Here with M&H probes, we just slide this off and the battery drops out and it's just a standard nine volt off the shelf battery. Now, in order to drive these probes and do the inspection on a machine, Hexagon Metrology has also developed software that allows us to have the operator quickly access these probes to get the information that they need. Typically, machine tool probes are gonna be used for three things. That's our work offsets, burning tool offsets, or doing some light inspection on the machine tool. The first software that we have on display up on this monitor is NC Gauge. It's our entry level product. What it's used for is an operator at the machine tool that needs to know how to do very simple routines at the machine tool with these probes. Uh, they can use NC Gauge. So in an hour or so, we can train the operator everything that they need to know about how to use our probes for some, some light duty work. And then behind me on this other side, we've got PCD Miss NC. Uh, what this product is, is our top level product. Uh, the idea there is that for those users that need advanced functionality, uh, they want to integrate with CAD packages or program offline or advanced GDNT, all that exists in this package here. And the idea here is that this product can monitor multiple machines simultaneously. So you could have multiple machines out on your shop floor, all of them running independently, manufacturing parts. Whenever any inspection needs to happen, uh, the operator calls up the program, the routine inspects the part, the data flows back here to this one station for analysis by anybody on the uh, manufacturing floor. Well, thanks Dave. Thanks Hexagon for another great Tech Corner. Thank you, Dirk, for presenting sure. that to us. That was a, a great conference that we were at, the Hexagon International Conference uh, in Orlando last month. And, and we got a couple more uh, products we'll be showing uh, eventually. That we will. We're going to have some more Tech Corners that we shot at that show. We're going to also still have that Norbert Hanka interview coming. That's so right. That'll, that'll be out here very soon as well. So thanks, Dirk. I'm sure our Emmy Award winning 
videographer will have that edited anytime and, soon. And that will be up, and that's a, <laughs> it's an interesting interview. So we look forward to that profiles and quality, and I'm sure right. you look forward to it as well. Well, thanks, Dirk. Sure. Well, uh, before we close the show, I want to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, Quality Digest Daily. Now, uh, as many of you are probably aware, we redesigned Quality Digest Daily, our, our daily e-newsletter. We redesigned that about two months ago. And one of the things, one of the sections that we added was what we call the fun stuff. That was uh, all the little water cooler uh, items, the odds and ends, the brain games, as well as our monthly contest. We run a contest every month in which we encourage all of you to to write in and, and, and uh, participate in the, in the contest, come up with the answer, and, and, uh, and obviously you can have a chance to win a prize. What we do is we do uh, a, a, a TomTom Tom GPS is, a, is what our giveaway is each month. Well, we encourage everyone here on our staff to come up with these games and these contests, and, and we had a great one in June called Devil, Devils in the Details, which was written by our own Kimber Evans, our account manager. And Kimber is with us today, right now, on the show to uh, introduce the, the, talk a little bit about the, the contest and announce the winner. Thank you very much. Well, um, as Mike said, you know, this was one that I had come up with and the name was actually introduced by Mike. Yes. Because he had such a devil of a time, as did everyone in our office, coming up with the answer. Yes, <laughs> I did. It's, that's very true. And many of you did as well. We had a lot of great comments, some saying, you know, the steps that they got stuck on or the wording of the direction. And so, um, but we did have over 100 successful entries. And so we want to thank you all for, for participating. Good job. And a special congratulations to Judy Stakinos. I'm sorry Stakinos. if I butcher your name. but uh, <laughs> Sorry, Judy. Sorry. You're getting a Tom Tom. It's on its way to you, so I want to encourage everyone to keep a lookout for our next challenging contest and uh, keep playing for your chance to win. That's right. We're going to be doing those every month, so uh, hopefully Kimber will come up with some more devilish contests, I'm sure, of some, some sort. Sneak a few past you guys. <laughs> uh, hopefully. We'll see. But that was great. Thank you for all participating, participating in that uh, this last month. But yes, on Tuesday after the holiday, we'll have another contest in QDD that you can check out and, uh, and participate in and have another chance to win. So thanks, Kimber. And thank you all for, for joining us again this week. Uh, before we close, I want to just uh, remind you all that on Monday, July 25th, from Phoenix, Arizona, we're going to be having a special uh, episode of QDL, QDL Roundtable, featuring two of the real, uh, real big names in our industry, uh, Tom Pysdeck and Michael Harry. And we'll be talking about Lean and Six Sigma, uh, U.S. competitiveness, government, a lot of great topics. And we encourage you to please watch that. Email us at qdl at qualitydigest.com if you have any questions you'd like to pose to, to Tom and to Michael before the episode or, or on the air. It'll be a one-hour episode that uh, I believe we're scheduling for 11 a.m. Western time, 2 p.m. Eastern. Again, that's Monday, July 25th. So look out for that. Well, that's our show, Kimber, for, for the week. Thank you for joining us all. And it's 4th of July on Monday, so have a great holiday weekend, and we'll see you next week. Me too. Have a great weekend. See you guys. <laughs> Bye.